So, Father, we ask that you may teach us according to your word, by your Holy Spirit, write your word in our hearts and move us to do what it says for our good and your glory. Amen. In 1886, the novelist Leo Tolstoy published a short story entitled How Much Land Does a Man Need? The story begins with Pahom. He's a peasant farmer who thinks to himself that his only trouble is that he just does not have enough land. As the story unfolds, Pahom takes an opportunity to buy some land. And that's followed by another opportunity and another and all the while his wealth increases, but he's never satisfied and always thinks, if only I had enough land, then my troubles would be over. Finally, he's introduced to the Bashkirs, and he is told that they are a simple-minded people who own a huge amount of land. Paham goes to them to take as much of their land as he can for as low a price as he can negotiate. Uh, and their deal, it turns out, is this. For a sum of 1,000 rubles, Pahom uh, can walk around as large an area as he wants, uh, starting at daybreak. And if he reaches the point where he started as, uh, by sunset that day, then the entire land that his route encloses will be his. But if he doesn't reach that starting point, he'll lose his money and receive no land. Pahom is delighted, believing he has chanced upon the bargain of a lifetime. So he gets up at the crack of dawn. He starts really early. He stays out as late as possible, marking out land until just before the sun sets. But then he looks up and he realises that he is far from the starting point. And so he starts to run. He runs as fast as he can to the waiting Bashkirs. And he finally arrives at the starting point just as the sun is dipping below the horizon. The Bashkirs cheer his good fortune. But exhausted from the run, Pahom drops dead. His servant digs a grave and the story ends with these words, six feet from his head to his heels was all the land he needed. This week and next, we are doing a short series on money. We all need it. We could all perhaps do with a little more of it. It affects almost every part of our lives. It's very powerful. And because of all of that, wealth and possessions are deeply connected to our spiritual lives, our lives lived before God. So money is a key area of discipleship, what it looks like to follow Jesus as our king. I've called this series Master or Servant, which is taken from Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll despise, uh, be devoted to one and despise the other. No one can serve both God and money. So this week we're looking at money as our master, and next week we'll look at money as our servant. Our key text for today is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll see whether I can call that up on the screen. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've heard the cliche, money is the root of all evil. And when we look around the world, so many of the problems that we see have at their heart money. But that cliche is actually a misquote from our New Testament reading, 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 10. Paul writes that it is not so much that money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is, the root, is a root of all kinds of evil. So we, before we come to this dark side of money, the first thing to say about money is that in itself, it is not evil. In fact, did you see what Paul goes on to say in verse 19? 
Yes, we are not to put our hope in wealth, but in God. More on that in a bit. But he is the one who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. And the point's this. God is our creator and sustainer. He provides everything for our enjoyment. The good things in his creation are there for us to enjoy, and that includes money. It's a good gift from God. Now, like all of God's gifts, money ultimately belongs to him, first and foremost. We're only stewards of the gifts God entrusts to us. And all Christian ethics are summed up in that one command to love your neighbor as yourself. So we are to do that with our money. But it's also there for us to enjoy. The Bible, of all the Bible says about money, it never says that we should be miserly scrooges who hold uh, hold tightly to our money and, and, and never enjoy it. It's okay enjoy it, to enjoy the blessings um, that God has given. Nevertheless, money does present us with grave spiritual danger. And so for the rest of this sermon, we're going to look at three points. The kinds of evil that come from money, the root of these, the love of money, and then the solution, how we can be freed from the love of money. So point one, the kinds of evil that flow from money. The Old Testament brings out the link between wealth, or a link between wealth and injustice. So often the rich fail to act justly toward the stranger, the widow, the orphan, and the poor. Job chapter 36 verse 18 says, Be careful that no one entices you by riches. Do not let a large bribe turn you aside. The prophet Samuel's sons are condemned as wicked because they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Here we see how evil can, uh, the evil that can flow from the love of money If money can buy you a favourable verdict in court, then the wealthy get richer, treading on the poor underfoot. The prophet Micah writes, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out because it is in their power to do so. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes and rob them of their inheritance. The prophet here exposes the dark side of that connection between wealth and power. Wealth is a source of power, and those with power can do what they can get away with. The wealthy and powerful in government or business can manipulate those uh, different avenues Uh, to turn more profit or to cover up unjust, exploitative, oppressive, illegal actions. We call this corruption. And in the end, there can be a contempt for human life itself, seeing people simply in terms of their economic value and utility, no different from other financial or material assets. So these injustices or social evils damage others but how does the love of money damage the self well have a look with me at 1 timothy chapter 6 verse 8 here's what timothy uh, what paul writes uh, verse 9 rather uh, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I imagine that Paul has in mind the kind of choices that a person makes when they prioritise getting rich over everything else. You know, you start 
maybe working and spending too much time at work rather than with your spouse or your kids, choosing work over family. Relationships can start to suffer. Resentment grows. There's conflict, estrangement, jealousy, anger. You know, you think of families that are torn apart over uh, inheritance, things like that. Maybe there's not being entirely honest in business, uh, cutting corners that compromise uh, the well-being, the safety of your employees, or squeezing them for what they can produce, or maybe your customers just for their cash rather than treating them first and foremost as human beings. All these things can wound the soul, and they come back to bite bringing ruin and destruction in your life and to those that you love. And when it comes to faith, Jesus says, the deceitfulness of wealth is like weeds that choke the word of God and make it unfruitful. Put money before God and you will remain spiritually an infant, malnourished, immature, selfish, and in the end, your love for God will grow cold. So there are some of the evils that come from the love of money. Let's go to the root, digging deeper. Paul says the problem isn't money so much as the love of money. This goes by various names, avarice, covetousness, greed, it's not being satisfied with what we have, not being content, as Paul talks about here, but rather wanting more than you have, simply that desire for more material prosperity. You know, imagine if we had to, say, name up our top three temptations or sins, few, if any of us, would say greed. We all know that it's kind of not okay but mostly it's not up there in what we might call the big sins. Writing 160 years ago, one commentator suggests this is because greed is so common because it's found among those who make pretensions to refinement and even religion. It's a kind of upper class sort of sin, if you like because it's not so easy to define what covetousness is as it is to define impurity of life, say, and because finally the public conscience is seared and the mind blinded to the low and groveling character of the sin. Hear that wonderful 19th century language. Well, what was true 160 years ago is certainly true today. Greed is the creed of Western culture. It's in the air we breathe. It shapes us from birth. And because of that, it is incredibly hard to see. Gordon Gekko in the 1987 film The Wolf of Wall Street, Wall Street puts it like this. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies. It cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit Greed in all its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind. Well, we might not be so crass as Gordon Gecko. Instead, we used more sanitized words. The economy, free market, choice. Theologian Brian Rosner writes, in Western society in general, the economy has achieved what can only be described as status equal to that of the sacred. Like God, the economy, it's thought, is capable of supplying people's needs without limit. Also like God, the economy is mysterious, unknowable, intransigent. It has both great power and despite the best managerial efforts of its associated clergy, great danger. It's an inexhaustible well of goods and is credited with prolonging life, giving health and enriching our lives. Money in which we put our faith and advertising which we adore are among its rituals. End quote. Well, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says that greed 
is idolatry. That is, greed is worshipping something in the place of God. The love of money rather than the love of God and then the love of our neighbour. Uh, we've seen how greed is an idol in our culture. But how does it work for us internally, for us as individuals? Well, idolatry is a fundamental problem that we have as human beings. 16th century theologian John Calvin paraphrased St. Paul, his diagnosis of the human condition when he said, the human heart is a factory of idols. So as we look at how greed plays out in, our, in the heart, we actually get an insight into how all idols in general enslave the soul. And it's only as we have that diagnosis that we can then find the cure. So I hope these reflections uh, will be helpful for you in discerning what may be an idol of your heart, be that greed or some other vice. Where our first insight comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, that first reading we had. And there we read that when Israel is in the promised land, they are enjoying its abundance. Their danger is that they may forget the Lord God. When life is good, Moses says, your heart will become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery, out of Egypt. You may be tempted to say, it's by my power, the strength of my hands, that has produced this wealth. And Moses says, do not forget your, the Lord your God, who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So greed, the love of money, leads to pride and forgetfulness. As the self looms large, God the source of all good things is pushed aside. And not only him, but also his commands, which teach us how we are to treat his creation, not least those who are made in his image, other people. Well, second, from Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12, we learn that greed leads to believing a lie, namely that life consists in the abundance of possessions. Watch out, Jesus says. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. But so often we think, actually it does. He who has the most toys wins. It's very easy to think that wealth and possessions will bring us a better life. As consumers, we are told that every day by advertising. Buy this product and you'll be happy. <laughs> well, returning again to 1 Timothy 6, Paul highlights two further things that the idol of money, the love of money, can do to us. So there's pride, forgetfulness, it's believing a lie. And then verse 17. Where are we here? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Wealth can become for us a source of status and identity so that we become arrogant and we look down on those who don't have as much as us. And wealth can also be something we look to for security, something we place our hope for the future in. But Paul reminds us, no, actually wealth is so uncertain and in the end it can bring no guarantee against death. Like the fool in Jesus' parable, our lives may be asked of us this very night and who then will get all that we've stored away? No, it is God who we can put our trust in, who we can hope in. He is the one who secures our eternal future, and what's more, 
He richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Okay, so we've uh, done a little bit of an analysis of the love of money. We've looked at the kinds of evil that the love of money produces. What about a cure? How do we wean ourselves off that love? Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money. So how can we not let money be the master and us servants of money, but rather use money to serve God, to love our neighbours? Well, I've got a few points here. Number one, Paul says hope in God, not money. He alone secure, has secured our eternal future at the infinite cost of his son. That's something money can never do. And you know, the future that he has for us is far sweeter, more satisfying, more exhilarating than anything money could buy. It's nothing less than the new creation. Everything that is evil and wrong with this world, every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more sorrow or crying or death. And in the end, we will see God face to face. So don't settle for less. Don't hope for less. Hope in God, the future that he has for us. Number two, if God is the source of all our blessings, that it's he who gives us the ability to produce wealth, well then practice thankfulness so that we give thanks to God rather than thinking it's me and my power that has produced all this wealth. What an antidote to pride. And if loving money means forgetting God, number three, then remembering God will wean you off money. And that's what church is all about, drawing our attention away from all that dis uh, the distractions of the, the various idols that sing that siren song for our affections and instead centering again on God, hearing again of his goodness and love and generous provision for us, praying Give us today our daily bread because God will provide and that is enough. Rehearsing the story of the gospel and our part of it in it each week in our prayers, in our songs, our greeting, the communion, even in, in our offerings as we give to God's work so that the gospel, the good news of God's love in Jesus sinks down into our bodies becomes unconscious habit for us. Well, number four, if greed, always wanting more, is the idol, then the discipline to unseat greed is generosity. To break the hold of possessions by holding lightly to what we possess. Command the rich, Paul says to Timothy, to do good to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And we're going to have a look more at that next week. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. That's the dark side of money. May God, in his mercy, deliver us from this temptation and renew our hope in him as the one who richly provides all that we need. May he give us the grace to be generous. And you know what? I give thanks and praise to God because I see many of you living this out and it is absolutely beautiful. So may God make his grace abound in each one of us. Amen. Uh, let me pray. Uh, Father, our hearts are too easily satisfied. Raise us to hope in you, your promises, the incredible future that you have for us. Help us to love you and to love our neighbours and not to love money first so that it can be 
not a terrible master that enslaves and destroys us, but one of your good gifts, given that we might serve. And we ask this for our good and your name's sake and the blessing of your world. Amen.